thank you, Dr. Prusner, for finishing up our conference. Um, and so you're, you have to leave us with the profound message that we should take home today. So uh, big responsibility. <laughs> um, and we were talking before, and I think uh, we haven't really talked a lot about this today, um, the issue of healthy aging and how that plays into our uh, new health system, uh, whatever it may be. We tend to focus on uh, you know, the, the more acute diseases. And you, were, we, you and I were talking earlier about Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Um, as a neurologist, so I, I, think, I think one of the things we really need to think about is what is aging? Well, the simple definition is getting older. Uh, but if we try to figure out how can we retard aging, how can we slow it down, and everybody would like to do this, uh, the big problems that people face as they get older are these terrible brain diseases. If you look at the statistics, if all of us in this room live to be 85, and we're all the same age at the same time, every other person in the room will be demented. And about a fifth of us will be frozen at the same time. And these odds are terrible. So if we can escape the diseases that we've been talking about today, mainly heart disease and cancer and diabetes uh, and um, obesity, uh, if we can get, push those things back, then we face Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's. So I think this is a huge, huge problem, and uh, we're not doing nearly enough to face this problem. And we can talk about the details a little more. Okay. What, what do you see as the kind of solutions we should be um, we should be looking towards? How much work is going into this now? Um, you know, we hear a lot about uh, medications to treat different acute conditions. But we also hear about uh, you know, a shortage of support for more basic research. So what do you want to see happen? Well, the big problem is that for all these diseases, which we call neurodegenerative diseases, there's not a single drug that halts or slows one of them. So there are drugs that we can give to ameliorate them in terms of the symptoms. So L-DOPA is a wonderful drug for Parkinson's disease. And in the early stages of Parkinson's disease, or the middle stages, I should say, where it's used the most, we see a vast improvement uh, for patients. But that's a symptomatic improvement. And I think the best example of this is John Paul II, the pope, who had Parkinson's disease. And you know he got all the best care. Uh, and in the process, he continued to go downhill. So the underlying neurodegeneration continued. And we have not a single drug that slows this down in any of the diseases we're talking about, including Lou Gehrig's disease, including the frontotemporal dementias, which have, very, have a very prominent place now in football players. You were talking about the NFL earlier. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, <coughs> these football players, soldiers, um, we don't know how many soldiers who have post-traumatic stress disorder suffer from a frontotemporal dementia, but we know some of them do and we don't have a single effective drug to stop this process. And why is that? I think it's in part because we're just beginning to learn uh, the causes of these diseases. Uh, we've thought for a long time that we understood them, but I think in the last five years we've seen a dramatic change, and we think now that each one of these uh, uh, offending proteins in each of these diseases becomes a prion, and this is the so the, what is a prion? A prion is a protein that adopts an alternative shape. So this mal-shaped protein then continues to stimulate more of itself to be accumulated. And that's at the root of these diseases. So we don't do enough research. The, can, the world of cancer has, at the NIH, six or seven billion dollars a year in research. Now, maybe it's even more. I'm never sure of these numbers. But that's, that, that's the number that's out there. And the pipeline, as I think most people at this conference know, is filled with anti-cancer drugs. There's six, seven hundred of these. It's very profitable. And in Alzheimer's disease, we're spending 500 million. We're spending a tenth for the research that goes on. And in part, that's because 
Alzheimer's disease wasn't even listed as a cause of death by the CDC until 1978. And in fact, it wasn't thought to be a disease. It was thought to be a condition of old age. And now we know that the number is much higher than we ever thought. So the CDC finally came to a number of 80,000. But through some very interesting epidemiologic studies, we now know the number is 500,000 deaths a year. And we also know that the cost to our society is about 200 billion annually, the same cost as cancer. And uh, you know, I was telling you earlier, um, I, I uh, was, was speaking to a young student, an MD, PhD student, who uh, was working on research on Lou Gehrig's disease, and I was all excited to hear about his work. And I said to him, so you're going to become a neurologist? And he said to me, really seriously, you know, no, I just want the patent. Um, how does that play? How does that, you know, you're a neurologist, a, a brain researcher. What does that say to you? I mean, I, I know neurology, um, it is a difficult field in terms of, you know, the, the, emo the emotional content uh, in your relations with patients. But certainly part of that is that there isn't a lot to offer patients right now. So well, we have a, we've, we've, we've improved dramatically with stroke. Yeah. This is much better. We've improved with seizures. We have lots of medications for seizures. Uh, and if we just, if we put neurology and psychiatry together, we have a lot of much better drugs. But I have to say, there are still diseases for which we have nothing, or very little. And yes, it's depressing. And of course, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease is one of these diseases. We have not a single drug. But that's part of the, that's one, another one of these neurodegenerative diseases yeah. that we don't even know how to slow down the disease. So it's, it is depressing, but that kind of comment to me is very depressing. Yeah, that, no, I don't mean it's, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's depressing to me because, uh, you know, all of us in this room, if we're lucky, we'll be 85, and we may well be among that, uh, you know, that half that's not lucky to have all our facilities about us. So the fact that there's this huge need and huge demand that our market isn't being met as there are, you know, dozens of Me Too cancer drugs coming yes. out is depressing. Well, I think that's depressing, but you know, unfortunately, I think, I mean, I didn't go into medicine to get wealthy. Mm. Uh, I went into medicine because I found it fascinating and I wanted to do something that I thought was really of great social value. And so I, when, I, when I hear those kinds of stories, I don't get too excited. In fact, I get a little depressed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Affordable Care Act and what's affordable for patients. Um, I know, you know, you and I both, uh, you know, started medicine at an era when things weren't that expensive and cost wasn't prohibitive. But now, for a lot of people, it is even with the Affordable Care Act. Um, well, I think two things. Let, let me start out by talking about Alzheimer's disease and the Affordable Care yeah. Act. So what do we have with Alzheimer's disease? We have half of all nursing home beds in America filled with Alzheimer's patients. And the other 50%, half of those people are cognitively impaired. So we, we're putting immense amounts of money into taking care of these people. And then, as I said to you, when you add up all the costs of taking care of these people, plus all the ones who are being cared for by their loved ones who can no longer go to work, and some of these people can't work, then the cost is 200 billion. It's really, so these kinds of diseases we need to do something about. And cancer's 200 billion. Well, if we didn't have all these cancer drugs, probably the numbers would be 400 billion. Uh, so I think that this is just such an important area to where there's no substitute for research. Mm. And that's going to really make the difference. Now, you know, I think everybody in this room has probably a slightly different view of the Affordable Care Act yeah. and what it means. Uh, and my own personal view is that for a long, long time, we've needed major health reform, and we haven't had it. And the idea that it shouldn't, that healthcare shouldn't be accessible to all people. And we were talking about the fact that I have a nephew with juvenile diabetes. And should, should this young man who doesn't want to work for a big corporation, who wants to be a 